Hey everybody, welcome to a brand new interview. I'm sitting with composer Jason Graves, who you know from just all his amazing work in, in game scoring from the Dead Space series to Tomb Raider to now the Dark Pictures Anthology, which is now completing its season one uh, with The Devil and Me. Uh, Jason, thank you so much for, for sitting down. It's so great to chat with you again. Happy to be here, man. It's been a while. It's been a while. But we can catch up. <laughs> we can totally catch up. So for anyone who's been with the channel for a while, we, we did have a chat way back, I think, when Tomb Raider came out. But let's just... to uh, uh, to start, to kickstart the conversation, I've been asking kind of this question to some composers recently, and I'm interested in, it's always, you know, it, it's a simple question, but maybe not so simple. So I'm just curious to you as a storyteller, as a musician, as a composer, as a human being, what does music mean to you? Whatever you make, however you make sense of that question, what does music mean Emotion. To you? Music is emotion. That's what it means to me. If it's yeah. a good, I mean, good's the wrong word, but if it's if it affects me emotionally, to me, that's sort of like the 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 box is ticked like a job well done. Nice. <laughs> so let's rewind back. I'm curious if you remember back to your childhood or whether, whether it was your childhood or adolescent years. or when, when do you remember that first spark of like interest when you where music kind of entered your life? Did you embrace it immediately? Did it was it a gradual thing? Do you even remember a moment like that? Or has it just always been part of your life? I'm curious if there was like a an aha moment or anything <laughs> yeah it's like a little a little bit of everything i mean i did like i sang in choirs uh in elementary school and i took piano lessons and i took i took dance lessons um i was a much better dancer than i was a, a pianist and i think i had this sort of innate innate rhythm and um i took guitar lessons and drum uh actually snare drum lessons like in in fifth or sixth grade i think and also taught myself to play bass and guitar. So all through high school, it was kind of like band instruments. I just, yeah. I just liked playing them. Um, guitars, guitar, keyboards, drums. I sang in the choir at school as well. And then majored in music. But I think the, the really big aha moment for me, retroactively, was when I saw um, E.T., which oh. was like, what, 82 or something? I mean, a long time ago. Yeah. But the, I mean, the music was great, right? I love the score. The score is amazing. But it's the the lack of dialogue in the first, what, five or eight minutes and the last five or eight minutes of music. Um, and so much action happens and the music just like takes you on that emotional journey the whole time. It was the first time I really noticed music, mm. I think because there wasn't any dialogue. And I was like, John Williams, right. He did like Star Wars and stuff too. And then fast forward through me doing all those lessons and stuff. And then Jurassic Park in what, like 93, I think 93. Yeah, yeah. 93. Yeah. Yeah. So more or less like 10 years later. Um, I remember listening to the album and loving all the tonal stuff, but the action stuff, like I literally had to turn off because it just like, it put me on edge too much. And now it doesn't bother me at all. I'm like, Oh, octatonic there. Oh, there's some half to Oh, the tritones with it's like, I'm, I'm analyzing it, but that's, that's the nature of, you know, listening to music for 30 years. <laughs> Absolutely. So when in your life did you remember it being like, okay, this is something I'm interested in. This is kind of like a, maybe a hobby of mine to, I want to pursue this as a career. Did that moment ever just present itself to you? Or did you make sure that that was going to be kind of your thing? Or, you know, I'm curious. Yeah, it did. Um, I was in high school, my sophomore year. I mean, I'd been playing all the instruments and listening to the music and movies didn't own any film scores or anything yet but my band director who is now basically my best friend here in town he's about 10 years older than i am and he played in a band he still plays uh but he brought his brand new at the time u20 keyboard into the band room he's like the cool band director who monday mornings would talk about you know the gig that they had and like you know just like make jokes and things so he brought in yeah. his keyboard and he didn't even say anything but he just sort of <laughs> up his finger and played piano and i was like oh cool it's piano and button and he played strings bum 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 and i was like whoa and then he played a harpsichord and he played a drum set and it was like hearing all those sounds coming out of that one keyboard was like the tunnel vision angels singing clouds parting like i don't know what that is but i want to do that like there's music there and it's yeah. So yeah. I didn't even realize I was wearing my Juno 106 shirt, but yeah. So I love synthesizers <laughs> amongst many other things, but that was the defining moment for me. 
Absolutely. So I know you, um, uh, you know, you went to, to school for, for composition and you studied under some, some pretty awesome, uh, you know, well-known composer, Jerry Goldsmith, Elmer Bernstein, Christopher Young. What were those years like and what were you absorbing from kind of those titans of the industry? And uh, were you, how did you kind of get your foot in the door when you into, I guess, after school? S school was part of it because I I did some work um, with Elmer Bernstein and I did some work with Christopher Young after school only because I had their uh, you know their phone number, um, yeah. so that was definitely part of it. Uh, but getting I mean anybody who was anybody in the mid nineties I got to meet them and or we even took let you know had classes with them or I got to do like some private lessons with them and it's anyone from I mean David Raxon taught a class Maurice Jarre was there. I mean, wow. all these composers that obviously it's 30 years ago. So a lot of them have have passed on. And at the time, I think I realized it was just as big of a deal as I realize it is now. It was just yeah. like, oh, my gosh, I'm sitting here listening to Maurice Jarre talk about uh, whatever um, or Christopher Young or Jerry Goldsmith or Elmer Bernstein. Um, and they're just dudes. I think that's the <laughs> biggest thing. They're just guys and they'll talk yeah. about music but then they'll talk about you know whatever uh, other things what they are eating for lunch or how bad the traffic was or um you know some other friend that they you know something or other something other tommy 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 you know, they're talking about thomas newman i'm like yeah of course tommy johnny <laughs> johnny johnny they're talking about john williams i realize now that um and i'm not comparing myself to those guys at all but my friends now in the game industry, especially, but also in film and TV, I know them by their first names and there's some pretty big names, but to me, they're just friends because I knew right. them 15 or 20 years ago. And that's how these guys were. They were just a little, a little further along in age experience and talent than I am, but it's just, it's just guys who love music and enjoy hanging out with each other really more than anything else. Absolutely. So uh, talk to me about, because you know, of course you've, you're known for your, your game scores. And if you look at your filmography or gamography, you have a lot. <laughs> you have your, the bulk of your career is, is in video games. Was that a conscious decision yep. from the start? What, what made you get into video games? What made you stay in video games? And uh, is there any desire to kind of branch out more into film and TV or is it just, and which you have, you do work in that as well, but the, the core focus of your career is games. So I'm curious what the, the appeal is to you and why do you love love it so much? I think the bottom line is I love writing music. And mm. the more I can write music that is sort of directly inspired by whatever it is I'm working on, um, a game, a film, a trailer, a TV show, uh, that's w without too much outside interference which is why we're leaning into games already, sort of the way I'm talking, where all the TV stuff that I've done has been um, kind of a, an additional music composer. So I'm not even the lead composer. I'm working with like Brian Tyler or Keith Powers, but it's basically like the music needs to sound like this. Right. And you, you sort of just, you know, fill in the gaps, basically. Um, even, even with film to a certain extent, I did some additional music um, on Prey, uh, with Sarah this year that yeah. came out, Sarah Schachner. And Sarah had a very specific idea of the way the score should sound. Um, but all of that, there was also just a lot of boundaries and a lot of, um, you know, rewrites, rewrites, rewrites. It's the nature of film. Yes. Where with TV, it's like, we need the next 20 minutes of music in the next four days. <laughs> so you kind of have these opposite uh, poles of deadlines. And with games, it's sort of like, we're doing something we need two or three hours of music in the next two years so just the the fluid nature of the schedule and the deadlines in games is a lot more relaxing and um a lot less repetition in terms of turning over new cuts new versions new edits new everything that you have to do with all the other things and you get um i mean there's you know an hour or two of cinematics in some of these games so you're kind of yeah dipping your beak in both pools where you're getting to do the interactive thing, but you're also getting to score the picture. 
I mean, yeah. yeah, I love talking to game composers because their perspective on things, it's, it's, I mean, that's an amazing perspective there. Cause I talked to like Enon Zor and who's kind of focused in games as well. And, you know, just kind of saying the similar things to you, just the kind of a little bit more freedom, uh, kind of letting your music, writing a lot of music, especially depending on the game. But you mentioned yeah. also cinematics. Let's jump into something cinematic, which is the Dark Pictures Anthology, which I absolutely oh, yeah. love. And, uh, you know, I, I remember when Until Dawn came out from Supermassive Games, and it was like an interactive film on, in a sense. And, uh, you know, with mocap performances from, you know, actual well-known actors and stuff like that. You know, Rami Malek was in there and some other actors that you, you'll you recognize. And same with the, the Dark Pictures Anthology. And I love the idea of taking, because uh, I think it's starting to come back a little bit more, kind of that horror anthology idea i know american horror story was kind of you know kind of big a few years you know when it started but you look back at the, like alfred hitchcock presents and you know tales from the crypt and it's kind of embedded elvira in, mistress of the yeah dark. <laughs> like twilight zone all these things yep, were just yep. kind of anthology horror things and now with gaming you were able, were able to do that so season one just concluded but uh talk to me i guess let's go back a little back to until dawn and when you worked on that on that game what was it like working on that game that was kind of scripted, kind of not, with so many different uh, you know paths that a player could take. Was it a, a nightmare for you to kind of find a narrative and, and score it, or was it kind of easy to once you kind of threaded everything through and kind of created? I'm curious what the, the process was for creating a score for a game like that. <laughs> um, it was a lot of fun, and as much work as I did on Until Dawn, all the credit needs to go to Barney Pratt, the audio director, because at the time. I'm pretty sure that it was just him, Barney and I were the only two cats working on the game, period. So not only did he do mm. all of the music implementation, which was extensive, he also did all the sound design and the sound design implementation. Ooh, um, wow. I think there were, you know, two or three hours of music. I, I can't quite remember, but I do remember that the in-game score was like 12 hours long because uh, the music was was written um it's like there's so many different ways to put music into games but for until dawn because it was so linear cinematically driven by choose your own adventure style things um i had to i didn't have to the idea was what barney and i came up with was first of all every instrument that i'm writing for you're getting on a separate stem and I always write, um, that was an orchestral score mostly. And I always do my orchestra. I mean, even in my template over here, it's like piccolo flute is at the top and double basses are at the bottom. And the, the brass is in the middle with the French horns above the trunk. I have it laid out like a classical score. And that's the way I gave him the stems. So he would have first violin, second violin, viola, cello, bass with independent stems, any synths, like everything's on its own. So we're talking, you know, 35 or 40 independent stems like per cue and that gave him the flexibility to sort of like take stuff apart and manipulate things like in different combinations and i overwrote all of the cues so you never really hear like everything playing in the game because yeah. it would sort of be like too much music but the idea was i mean sometimes i do two or three different passes of violins like a a like something kind of doing eighth notes if it's like a stalking thing and then another thing doing 16th notes and then another thing like doing runs so he would have three variations of the same violin to work with the other stems because it's all about shaking it up and making it feel fresh i've yeah. always been such a um loops just depress me so i don't want to hear <laughs> like a 60 second loop i i would rather write a couple of variations and i learned that in tomb raider um it's better to spend a little extra time, give the developer a little more choice, and then they're going to just run with anything that they have because they don't want to loop the music either. It's just yeah. a matter of you know how much music they have and then how much time they have to implement the music. And I found variations on tracks are a lot more effective than just writing more music because sometimes more music means just more work in general where variations are like oh i could just swap out the violins mute the percussion and bring the low synth in now i've got an extra 30 or 45 seconds of music um that was how we approached until dawn and it was very very much the way that barney implemented everything he was mm -hmm. The game got, the release got put on hold because it was right between the PS4 and uh, PS3 and PS4. Right. 
Uh, yeah. It was going to be a um, a PS3 move um, game, and it ended up getting delayed because Sony was like, "We want this to be a PS4, like re- uh, you know, one of the launch the titles for launch PS4." Title, yeah. So as a result, Barney basically, I, I wrote all the music, and then Barney had two years to go do all the stuff, and then the game came out. Wow. <laughs> that's how much work he put into it. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. So yeah. I mean, and the final, yeah, the final uh, uh, result was just fantastic and it was thrilling. And I remember, you know, just playing it. I was actually, you know, getting scared and trying to make sure your, you know, your characters survive and make sure your every choice matters. And so fast forward to Dark Pictures Anthology, which is a little bit more of an ambitious thing where it's like, okay, now we're going to do a little bit shorter games, more condensed, but like still beefy enough. And, you know, it still will take some time, but and do multiple, multiple of them across, you know, a period of time and call it a, an anthology, a, a season, essentially. So what did you learn from Until Dawn that was able to be applied here? Or was this a completely different tactic or approach that needed to be had? Yeah, it was sort of like Until Dawn was the starting point. But as soon as we jumped in to Man of Medan, um, Until Dawn was, I talk with my hands, I can't help it. But <laughs> Until Dawn was like this very long like multi-layered sort of experience. And if you take Mm -hmm. Until Dawn and go to uh, any of the dark pictures, it kind of goes like this. So the gameplay is shorter, but the depth of the gameplay is is a lot deeper. There's like, I mean, so many different variations, uh, so many different death variations, so many different story variations. So it was really just a matter of doing more of the, the same thing that I did in Until Dawn. However, I found the um, super dense music that you would never listen to was sort of starting to wear on me a little bit. And Mm. I suggested to Barney, I think maybe for House of Ashes, um, because he would come there, they'd come back with like, oh, this one cue, you know, in these, the second 32 bars, could we get an extra sound that does this or does that? And I would, I would give it to him. Um, I said for House of Ashes, you know, what if, if it's supposed to be a three minute cue um, that's really dense, I'm going to write a six minute cue that's, that's more, more linear and and cinematic. Cause I I wanted to be able to sort of do those things that I love hearing in films because they're to picture. But when you listen to the soundtrack, I mean, even if you know the film, you know what's happening. But if you if you don't know the film or you're not familiar with the scene, the music's stopping and pausing and building up and it jumps into a chase. And then there's a you know, it just it's telling a story. And I like the idea of game music doing that, even if it's just an action track that's supposed to be three minutes long, because there's always these happy accidents. You, yeah. you watch it against gameplay and the music builds up and does this big crescendo and it's real tense and high and like the bottom drops out and you feel like something's happening like more than what's actually happening when you're playing the game. But as a as a player, you're like emotionally like, well, oh, what's going on? And then it goes, but it kicks back in and starts running and it just, it makes such a difference as opposed to it just, you know, kind of yeah. doing its thing for, for two minutes. Um, I was able to do that, that sort of, peaks and valleys like linear storytelling um a lot easier if i just thin, literally just did this and kind of thinned everything out but i was still giving the super massive the same amount of uh, like music to use it was just easier for everybody honestly because um there was more of a story there they didn't have to like carve it out it wasn't this giant block of sound they could sort of choose moments and i actually ended up not doing i think i only did two stingers for that because they were getting stingers from the tracks because they were a lot less dense. So we did that for House of Ashes and then we did that also for um, The Devil in Me. It's turned out to work really well. It's it's much more satisfying for me. So if you listen like to the soundtrack, those tracks are a lot longer than they were for the soundtrack for like, well, I I think that I built the tracks for the first two games. So they're probably about the same length, but I had to spend a week on Man of Medan and um, Little Hope, like doing this and trying to eke kind of a soundtrack experience for the OST, where the last two games in the anthology are literally just a selection of cues that I Mm. sent to the developer. 
all I did was master them here in the studio. I didn't change anything. So what you hear on those soundtracks is literally what I sent them, which is why they're all longer. They're like four to seven minutes or something. I don't remember. Wow, that's that's super yeah. interesting. I'm curious. Uh, so let's talk about the the stories, the the step that how you're writing to the narrative. And I'm curious, how do you write to a narrative like this? Uh, what is exactly the starting point? Where does like I guess the first note come from? What is the your 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 kind of origin start? And like, do you are you looking? Is there a script to look at? Are you looking at any kind of uh, early concept art? Are you trying to come up with ideas and themes and tones and atmospheres? Or are you just immediately given chunks of gameplay to start working around with? I'm curious kind of where the starting point is. All those things. Yeah, it's <laughs> like... Um, the interesting thing about the Dark Pictures, we did four games in four years. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> which is kind of amazing. And... Yeah. Even every time it started slightly different. So sometimes there'd be gameplay to look at. There's always a script. Uh, by the time I get the script, it's already been changed five times. So I don't really read the script. Um, yeah. I always have a talk with the uh, the creative director or the, the producer, um, Will Boyles, or any of those guys over at Supermassive. I know all of them now, and they're just amazingly fun people to work with. Um, you know, lots of concept art. Um, I kind of get the presentation that, you know, maybe the developer would give like to the publisher, sort of the show and tell about what it's all going to be. And um, I, lots of conversations with Barney and I, I keep mentioning him, but I've known Barney. We've been working together for like 11 or 12 years now. Yeah. And it, it's like, I understand what he wants when he's trying to explain something, but he also understands what, what I mean when I'm trying to explain something. It's that, like any director film composer long-term relationship so usually it starts with just emotions in general but also setting has a lot to do with it for me um if you look at the settings of these four games you've got essentially like on the ocean present day more or less for the first game for um man and Madan. and then like uh weird time travel i'm trying not to do any spoilers like weird things like late 1600s puritan kind of times but also modern for um little hope then you go to house of ashes and it's like 1990s iraq yeah military um and then the most recent one is like also is current times but yeah. it's also based on this historical thing so any of those descriptions just in general sort of conjure uh, certain instruments kind of in in my head um a little hope it was all i don't think i have anything out but it, like it was all i've got some things over there like hurdy-gurdies and and dulcimers and detuned things and as much as i could play that was small and live and just sounded really kind of nasty and discordant and my daughter sang um on the mm -hmm. on the the lead song and i also got her to do a bunch of like it's like just pretend you're a ghost and she'd go Ooh. i'm like that's perfect and i'd throw it in the contact and drop it an octave and put some reverb on it and she'd be like oh my gosh is that me but she <laughs> she's singing throughout the whole soundtrack um and house of ashes was very i played um a bunch of my strings all the strings on house of ashes are me playing live wow um because we wanted to record strings, but the pandemic had kicked in and I had yeah. to, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Um, but lots of like bending strings and like kind of out of tune strings, but also um, synths, lots of synthesizers, um, which represents something that happens later in the game. But the score kind of goes from these strings to a more traditional thing in the middle, sort of a aliens kind of vibe. And then it goes to this like all synths vibe at the end. And that's all based on where you are, your physical location in the game. Yeah. Um, it was just like if you were going to score a film, except um, I get, you know, I'm not John Williams. So if I were going to score a film, I'd have lots of temp track. You know, I have to do a lot of other things where with games, it's more I have a lot more freedom, which is just amazing. Was the production schedule great? Like you mentioned four games in four years. Was it, did it you know, we started talking about how you love the freedom of space that you can have with games, but with this one, did you feel any kind of crunch at all with them or did you still have enough time to play around and kind of breathe and, and get everything done? No, th this last time around actually. Um, and 
the last two games, as a matter of fact. So House of Ashes, I started in my in my master bedroom, which is through a couple of doors that way. And right around when the deadlines were, which I think were like November or December, um, I moved into this studio in September. So I had to shut down for what was going to be three weeks. And with the amount of insane cabling, it ended up being six. So oh. they were waiting on me because I just I couldn't physically work. Um, but they were very patient and great. I jumped right in and we were in, we ended up getting what I think was the the best score because I kind of had both studios to work from and I mixed all the final cues in here. But same thing with the last game. Um, there were just deadlines and crazy things happening and I'm usually pretty good at, at juggling. Yeah. I'll just, okay, today I'm doing, you know, um, whatever it was during um, The Devil in Me. I'm doing Devil in Me today and I'm going to do like two or three or four minutes of music or a cue and then tomorrow I'm doing this other thing and then I'm doing this thing. And there was just it was a little bit of a crazy year the last couple of years because the pandemic, yeah. um, I know a lot of people were like worried about work, but games sort of ramped up and a lot of stuff that was supposed to be coming for me in terms of work, uh, six or nine months sort of accelerated and there was many more plates in the air which is uh, an amazing thing to have but uh yeah i mean speaking frankly they were incredibly patient because a lot of times they wanted me to start on devil in me i think last november and i was like i i can't start until february i i just no. i just can't i mean period there's no way he's like okay no no worries no worries but i started in february and we finished it in august i think february march april June, July. yeah about six months um wow. it's about half of our normal schedule but in a way, it was kind of nice because more of the game was finished. Um, I wouldn't normally want to rush it quite that much, but they were dropping things in immediately. And I was kind of working consistently where normally it's over a year or a year and a half. And we sort of check in like every couple of months, I'll do something else back and forth. This was like more consistent, which was good because I was it's kind of trying to figure out how to nail the tone of this last one because it's it's different. Um, did you get did you get any particular sort of vibe from from the music? I don't know if you've heard the music on its own as opposed to just in the game. I've been, li I've been listening to the soundtrack, um, but mm. I have I haven't played the game yet, which I tried not to listen. I always like to hear it in context first. So I didn't. Yeah, fully, sure. I haven't fully explored the album yet, but um, I do intend on uh, diving into it once I, I get some time. But um, but yeah. So what were you trying to do? differently that the other ones uh that the other ones had well it's like so if you see the trailer there's there's no spoilers here the, yeah. the the plot of the game is that a person has recreated this murder house from hh H. holmes from like the late 1800s or inherited i guess they inherited a recreated murder house that's like these interesting things that happen within the walls and a film crew goes to shoot like a kind of documentary there um, but I loved the the idea, the origin of H.H. H. Holmes in general being in the, mm. the 1800s. And we were trying to go for like a like a noir kind of 50s style with the music. Um, that's something that Barney and I kind of came up with. Uh, I knew that he said they were planning on using a lot of classical pieces, especially during like some of the more dramatic scenes. They'd sort of, you know, use diegetic music. Um, yeah. that would maybe be piped in like over speakers in the room or something and that made it easy for the the scary music because we wanted to be able to superimpose the two and if you've got this classical piece or an aria with the lady singing opera I'm like I'll just do you know completely aleatoric like high string gestures and things that have no rhythm and you can superimpose them and they'll all be oh, great wow. we tried some things like dipping some EQs and crossfading different tracks to see how it would work uh, and it ended up working pretty well. So that was easy. But the hard part was the the noir, like, psycho style yeah. um, uh, writing. And a big part of it was just trying to get um, get the orchestra sounding the way I wanted it. Um, I wanted something really up close and sort of in your face and present. But again, this was still during lockdown, so we we couldn't record in anything. So I had to use you know my strings and my instruments and sort of augment them with some of my own um, custom samples. 
but it's hard if you're talking about virtual orchestra even with me playing some live stuff on top the reverb is usually what makes it like sells it as a real orchestra right because you get that yeah. big space and that right. sense of a scoring stage but i didn't want that so a lot of it um like even from the very first track just the real dum 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 like the real insistent like super dry super sharp staccato strings that took a long time to kind of dial in the, the way i wanted because it, it's a combination of me playing strings and some like very close mics of my own um my own orchestra samples but in the end um i liked it i think when i started doing ticking clock like timer uh there's animatronics in the game that you know mm -hmm. they make those noises when i started incorporating that into the score it kind of gave it a backbone and um the the real thing that got me barney actually i had this uh boo 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 this four note ascending thing that i did like in the in the main theme as a as a propulsion device and barney was like i like that you need to use that everywhere and i went oh, okay <laughs> sure and that ended up being like kind of the calling card for the score so even if it's a major seven chord there's still a boo 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 but it's outlining a major seven triad or if it's a minor chord it's outlining a minor triad just the simplicity of those four notes i think was sort of the kind of the soul of the score and it's creepy but it's also like kind of consistent and reassuring but also it can be a little like oh, it's still going what's gonna yeah. happen like a timer ticking down yeah 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 you get that that suspense and that tension uh yeah. which uh i'm curious about i was i want to talk to game composers about what i call oh shit moments where it's like where the music is kind of telling you something's going to happen <laughs> and yeah. probably, maybe it doesn't really happen as much in more of a little linear thing like dark dark uh dark pictures anthology which is kind of a little bit more focused and pushing the player in a certain direction but um open world games and you always have the something you trigger and the music comes in is there is there kind of a secret to you that you found out to get, making like the great music that really just kind of instills fear and like tension and dread in somebody <laughs> it's i mean nothing that's not you know the, the usual thing that's been happening since you know goldsmith scored alien or or whatever a lot mm. of it i've played through the whole game twice now with my with my youngest daughter um we've played through all of them together and I'm sort of hearing the music, not for the first time. Barney keeps me in the loop, but and I can't, I can't, you know, they, there's variations and different edits and I'm usually a little behind the times. So I'm kind of hearing it and experiencing it with fresh ears. And Mally will be playing and she'll literally be like, why the music fade out? And she'll stop. Like, <laughs> she's like, something's going to happen. I don't know if I want to go down this hallway and she'll turn around and go back the other way. <laughs> exactly like the music hasn't come back in yet yep. she's walking and she goes and then there's a like you know inspect button she's like i don't want to inspect it you're gonna scare me she's talking to me yeah. she gets inspected and goes and she's like oh my god and yeah it's like the usual the usual kind of things it's all about yeah. the anticipation you know it's all about having those different registers you know you drop out the bottom end and it goes from something tonal to something not tonal in the top end um yeah i mean and, and what's it like as a composer? Because I know with gaming, it is something sometimes like that where you send off music and yeah, you're, it's up to your audio director to kind of implement it and fine tune it and use your stems and stuff like that. Because mm -hmm. I remember I've talked, I talked to a lot of film composers who uh, maybe are not doing game music as much and they are like, oh yeah, I just sent the music off and I don't know how it, it was used until I, you know, you see the final game and you play it. And and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're more in the loop with that, but I'm curious as, you know, you're saying you're experiencing almost kind of like, for the first time what's that like for you writing on working on something so long and then seeing that polished finished product <laughs> it's definitely cool um super massive games uh there's just there's so many versions of everything i couldn't possibly keep up with it so it's like yeah. a fresh experience for me plus i mean the second time we played through it she intentionally made different choices so it was a completely right. different score for the next six hours um, that's a, that's a real pleasure. Cause a lot of times I'll recognize things. Um, sometimes I'm just like, I have no memory of, of even doing this, but, or I'll be like, I don't know what that is. I'm like, Oh, he just grabbed that major seven chord and dropped it in that middle of the queue just for a second, because it was like a moment of relief. Right. Um, there was a great one from house of ashes 
uh, that was at the it was at the end of the game, and it referenced something at the beginning of the game. And uh, Barney nor I knew that that was going to happen until the very end. But since we were locked into a certain number of tempos and keys, he was able to take the choir and the melody I had written for this character at the beginning of the game and drop it over the action music at the end of the game. And I literally stood up and clapped. I was like, he did that and he put it in the, and it totally works. And Mally was just like, it sounds really cool to me. Did you not write that? I'm like, no, I wrote it, but I didn't like, I didn't mash it together, but it, it fit for the story. Yeah. And even she's like, oh my gosh, why is the choir singing again? <laughs> Yeah, like all those. That was that was not a happy accident. That was intentionally right. um, intentionally done. But the the other end of the spectrum is um, a game that I just finished, and another game I'm just starting on. Like I'm doing the implementation for the audio because it's more about uh, like open world yeah. and having it so that when you walk around for five minutes, even though you're not triggering anything or making any decisions, the music's sort of evolving and changing. So I'm I'm in this program we use called Wise, which is a third app kind of developer. Um, I'm in Wise uploading my stems and tweaking things and then playing mm. the game and listening to it um, after it's been updated. And it sort of, you know, depends on what the game needs, really, more than anything yeah. else. It's so fascinating. I mean, I just there's so many options and so many paths. And I think game development is super interesting. And of course, it's, you know, the biggest uh you know the biggest industry you know in terms of like people playing in terms of gross you know income and everything i mean outpacing yep. film and music and tv combined it's kind of crazy i mean you see like a game like call of duty come out and make like a billion dollars in 10 days and it's just like i know or you see you know a game like you know selling a million copies so quickly but um so i'm talking about kind of the future the the new things in gaming vr is definitely making its splash and everybody's kind of really investing in it. and of course dark pictures is doing for psvr to uh switchback vr which you're composing the score as well coming out in february so i'm curious what are your take what is your take on vr what's, what's it like composing for vr and where are we on the timeline to kind of maybe have wider implementation and wider accessibility where the you know the gear isn't so expensive and you know bulky you yep know? It's it's all about how much the gear costs, you know. Until yeah. until it can be something that is um, relatively inexpensive as an add-on to an existing game box, whatever the platform is, there's that's that's the tiniest door that you have to try to get people to walk through. Um, I haven't updated my VR rig since I did Moss Book One, which was like three years ago, I think. Um, yeah. But I have done a bunch of VR games and. Um, like games like Moss and Moss Book Two just came out earlier this year. Uh, that has nothing. VR has nothing to do with the music. It's a very story-driven game, and I just they just they just let me write like whatever I think. Like I just want to write like beautiful melodies and like do jazz harmonies and like make it kind of Celticy. And they're like, okay, fine. <laughs> However, something like Switchback, um, because of uh, your your. Uh, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say. I won't say anything. Um, sure, so with, with Switchback, <laughs> though, um, like there was a lot of specific directives from Barney, like don't do a lot of, you know, high end um, like things like tinkles or like we reverb delays and stuff up here because you're in VR. And when you're looking around, the idea is you're getting clues from the audio. So if the source is coming from over here, you can you can listen to it and the music is usually just it's like you're wearing headphones so no matter yeah. where you turn your head the music is kind of seated and we we made clear choices to keep the music sort of carved out mm. from the spaces that you would be getting audio cues from from the game but so the switchback is a yeah. lot busier it's like a lot busier there's a lot more going on and the sound design is a lot more over the top where moss was very sort of grounded and i mean magical but a lot more open in the soundscape absolutely so um as to as we kind of wrap up a bit i'm curious you know you've been working in this industry for i mean most most of your career and i'm curious <laughs> what has changed the most since you started and where do you think it's going you know gaming has kind of been in the news recently a lot especially because a lot of mergers the activision stuff cr crunch culture and stuff like that and and of course, it's just booming. I mean, Nintendo, all PlayStation, Xbox, we're all just, I mean, creating the most amazing content too. I mean, just stories that are just so immersive and, yep. and some of the best storytelling that on, you know, visual 
storytelling can do. So I'm curious, where do you think it's going? What has changed and where do you think the industry is going? So what, uh, one of the first games I did, what was it called? It was like the light of the force or the something. It was a Star Wars, a licensed Star Wars game for Nintendo DS. And there were like four or five of us on the title, but I had to take the end cue, whatever it is from Star Wars, when they're doing the Death Star run, I had to take that and adapt it for two sine waves and a white noise generator. <laughs> um, that was one of my first games. So talk about limitations. It's literally yeah. like the 8-bit Mario, everything, Donkey Kong, those limitations. Um, when CD-ROMs came out, obviously we could do digital audio, so that was a lot better. I mean, I've done like so many things where you had to learn this specific little thing that does all these stuff and go to a class and you could upload the sounds into the games like EPRAM and then you'd have to use DL little downloadable sound fonts and like write MIDI stuff and put that into the game engine and <laughs> just ridiculous. Um, I think the first thing was like 2006 with Dead Space. EA had their own audio engine and it was proprietary and we were able to stream four stereo tracks of audio like straight from the disc and on top of that we had a ram buffer for stingers and all those could play at the same time fast forward and we had a limitation it was like we could only do like i think two hours of music or two and a half hours of music on the physical disc fast forward three years dead space 2 doubled all of that wow. eight streams bigger ram bucket four hours of music um go 10 years forward to now and um it's basically like we can you know, we we can do as many, uh, this game I just finished where I was programming, I said, well, how many, you know, this one cue that's doing these eight different chunks of music and randomly going back before, how many stems can we do? Said, well, how many stems do you want to do? It's like, well, I, I mean, if I'm having them randomly mute like a third of the stems each time, I mean, maybe six or eight, would that be enough? Oh, I, I thought you wanted like 20. I'm like, no, 20 <laughs> is way too much work we can do as many as you want. And it's like, you're unlimited now because wow. the music footprint, you know, is like this <laughs> in terms yeah. of the, the graphics and the power that it needs to do all the graphics. And I mean, there's reverbs, there's like 15, 20, 30 reverbs running in real time. Like these IR convolution reverbs, like all this crazy stuff happening with like a shooter, like call of duty or something. Yeah. It's just insane. So really the limitation is, the physical human ability to put the stuff into the game. Right. Um, and that's, the, that's a great limitation to have. We're no longer limited by technology. That's amazing. Yeah. You, you, you've touched on something that, that sparked a, a question of mine, because uh, uh, you mentioned that your first game was a Star Wars kind of license thing, and you've done uh, your fair share of kind of a movie tie-in uh, game. So <laughs> I'm curious, as a composer, when you have to follow a movie tie-in and you kind of don't have the rights maybe to the original you know score and you have to kind of almost be boxed in to sound like that do you find that limiting or or, or kind of a creative challenge to like okay how am i going to make my spin on it but also feel true to you know we, we're you know basing this off a movie that's you know out there very popular and very well known <laughs> yeah um that's that's hard for me to answer accurately now because I haven't done one of those in such a long time. But when right, I sure. did do them, you know, like in the first 10 years of my career, I was really hungry and I needed the work. So it was it was just an exciting opportunity, uh, no matter what. Um, yeah, very, yeah. One of the very first games that I did was um, Wild Wild West. Not that great of a film, um, but Elmer <laughs> Bernstein uh, scored the movie and yeah. I literally just came from school like a year earlier or something so I just called him up and I was like hey can I'm I'm doing the music for the game and he's like oh hey I'm recording the score in two weeks why don't you come out to the session so I got to I went and went to the session and and he gave me the scores and like that was great because I was I was implementing his music yeah. um like directly I've done, uh, I did Flushed Away, which I think Harry Gregson Williams did. So I, yeah. I talked with um, Harry on the phone a couple of times and kind of got his impressions of the score and sent him some stuff. Like, is this kind of what you were thinking? Just to to honor the idea of what he was yeah. doing. Um, uh, Howard Bernstein, uh, there's some other ones as well. Oh, I did um, King Arthur. That was, that was actually kind of a big deal because they were going to, um, they were going to, use Hans Zimmer's main theme 
Mm. And I wrote a main theme because I had to start using something. And I knew it needed to sound like Hans Zimmer, but uh, okay, I'll, I'll do like the, make it like good, but simple and something catchy and something like a little more song driven. And um, then they ended up not using Hans's theme. So they used my theme. And then in the reviews for the game, everyone's like, they just used the music from the film and it sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, um, I guess that's a great compliment. Um, and then I met Hans uh, for this film composer competition like 20 years ago. And he was like, Jason Graves, you're the one that did the music for King Arthur, the game music, right? And I was like, yep, yep, <laughs> that's me. And he could have been a jerk about it, but he was the nicest guy in the world. I actually asked him a couple of really mean, pointed questions. And he was the biggest gentleman and just oh, yeah. uh, in incredibly kind. And I've, I've gotten to know Lauren Balf fairly well since then. And yeah, I've met Lauren him a well. couple of other times. Yeah. So it's, it's very, like, very, very casual, very, very great. Um, but, yeah, it's... I think it's a privilege to do something like that, um, yeah. especially if you get to work with the composer. That I was always like, you know, just give me a chance to call Harry Gregson Williams. I'll be happy. <laughs> I love I, I, that's the first time I've heard that. That, that makes me feel great inside because that, that's showing the respect of that. And I'm, I'm sure they appreciate it immensely, you know, because yeah. that's their baby as well. And, you know, it's kind of still representing, you know, the, the movie in some way. But but yeah, that's that's a completely unique approach. That's that's I always thought that might be <laughs> boxing for you know kind of boxed in for a composer. Like oh, I got a almost like temp tracking where you have to kind of sound like the same. But you know, but <laughs> but um, but to to wrap up, I do want to just get your uh, you know, I'm I'm super excited about it. I know the world's excited about it. But the Dead Space remake is finally upon us, and I know oh, that your yeah. score is being implemented back in to this complete mm -hmm. ground up remake. Are you? What, what are you going to check it out? What do you think uh, you're going to oh, be yeah. like playing this new visual representation, but still kind of your score from back when I was God still in college. <laughs> I, I can, I, I used to say that like being asked to come back for a sequel is sort of the greatest compliment that a composer could get because yeah. they liked you enough the first time to ask you to come back. But I think this is really the greatest compliment that I've received because everything else was built from the ground up. And right. I I just assumed they were going to rescore it. Um, no one, re you know, no one reached out to me. I was finding out about this the same way everybody else was. Um, you know, I never like called Steve Schnur at EA or like asked anybody what was going on. If, if they need me, they'll call me. That's totally fine. And then when they said they were going to use the original music, it was just like, oh, really? That is so kind. I mean, obviously it, it it means something to the game, but just I think the audio director um, is also a, a composer, and I believe they had a couple of extra levels that they added in the game. This is mm -hmm. what my publicist told me, and he wrote some extra music for that. So obviously, the dude can write music and can you know write for orchestra, and I'm sure it's going to sound incredible. I, I can't wait to hear it, and that even is another step of just further yeah. compliment that that they're using it again. I love it. That's yeah, that that's amazing, and, and I don't I don't th I think people would have been furious if they touched your score because <laughs> so, <laughs> it's so oh god, it's so well done, and the entire your entire work on the Dead Space series is just fantastic. So but I'm excited oh, well, to thank you, thank you to dive back that back into that um but uh jason thank you so much for your time this evening and for sitting down and chatting and it's always a pleasure to, to to pick your brain and, and thank you for all your insight so thanks so much you got it you're very welcome thanks for all the great questions